Graham Matthews here with Bleach Report ahead of the upcoming episode of Biography WWE Legends on Roman Reigns, the reigning undisputed WWE Universal Champion. We're talking to the wise man here today, upcoming WWE Hall of Fame inductee and the director, executive director and producer of this documentary, Mr. Paul Heyman. Paul, thanks for taking the time, man. Pleasure is all mine, sir. Great to speak with you again. Just talk a little bit about this documentary, being the executive producer and the director for it as well. Obviously not a role that you're unfamiliar with, given your time in the industry and everything you've done in recent years and orchestrating the rise of the bloodline and everything else like that. Talk about the role that you played in this documentary and how it came out. Well, Roman Reigns is not a man that wants to be one of many. Roman Reigns is a man that wants to pursue greatness at all costs. And when he, Roman Reigns was approached about doing the A&E biography of Roman Reigns, he didn't just want to do another biography. Roman Reigns wanted to do the best biography in the history of television, not just even in, of WWE biographies, but of all biographies. Roman wanted to do a biography that was worthy of Emmy consideration. And if not, then uh, if, if it doesn't get Emmy consideration, then uh, worthy of the Emmys being accused of corruption for not nominating us. So in order to pursue that level of presentation, he knew he needed someone to tell his tale from a passionate perspective and someone that knew him intimately enough that he would be presented in a light that he felt was authentic warts and all. So the approach to this biography was unlike any other in that we weren't just there to peel back the curtain and let you know Joe Anawaii, the man behind Roman Reigns, but also the, the untold stories of his life, that when the biography was over, a viewer would sit back and say, I not only understand the tribal chief Roman Reigns far better now, oh my God, I never knew that about the man behind the persona of Roman Reigns. And I find him to be as fascinating and interesting as the presentation of Roman Reigns on WWE television. And all the time that you spent with Roman, obviously the documentary itself is going to cover everything you just said and kind of like the life behind the scenes of the Universal Champion and everything else. In the time that you've spent with him personally in the last couple of years, what would you say, and again, this might be covered in the doc, would surprise people the most about Roman Reigns, the person? That what you see on WWE television is exactly what you get. That SmackDown is the greatest reality show in the history of television. Because on the Friday nights that feature Roman Reigns, you get to see an authentic portrayal of the, T-H-E-E, -E, the top star in the entire industry. That he presents to you the responsibility and the obligation and the accountability of being the top star. And he has no problems articulating the burden of being the top star, not just in WWE, but in the entire industry as well. And that's something that no one else has ever accurately portrayed, cert portrayed certainly on, a, on the cinematic level that Roman Reigns has portrayed it before in the history of sports entertainment. I mean, the name of the show is Legends, WWE biography, Legends. And in this season alone, we've gotten Sergeant Slaughter, Scott Hall, Diamond Dallas Page, among other people across all the other seasons. Roman Reigns is one of the few people covered so far that is an, obviously a legend in his own right, but one of the only people to be an active performer of the roster right now. According to you, Paul, in your opinion, when do you think Roman kind of surpassed that legend territory that kind of makes him worthy of being covered for a show like this at this specific point in his career? Midway through the last decade, I think Roman Reigns was worthy of being called the legend when he had already main evented three or four consecutive WrestleManias. And this was while he was still the big dog Roman Reigns. And we had not entered the era of the tribal chief, the head of the table, the undisputed WWE Universal Heavyweight Champion Roman Reigns, which was August 2020. Um, I think he was already a legend when we got paired together on television 
and everything that was accomplished before August 2020 would, by our design, pale by comparison to what gets accomplished after August 2020, which is something that was discussed in depth in this documentary, which was his constant, consistent uh, pursuit of greatness. As we head into WrestleMania, he's almost four years into his run right now as the Universal Champion, having broken so many records and whatnot since winning the championship, like you said, back in August of 2020, you guys pairing together two days before he won that championship. Talk about the cliche question always gets asked. I'm sure you've already been asked today, Paul, a number of times. What inning are we in now with the bloodline? Well, cliches are everybody. Every, every, I, I'm telling you this. Everyone in the room here is laughing. Um, I, 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 I gave a baseball analogy at one point, and and people have been challenging that analogy a, ever since, mostly because um, I think everyone now understands that baseball is fake. And so analogies to baseball don't hold in, in our world. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be hesitant in naming what inning that we're actually in, except to suggest that with the advent of Solo's rise up the ladder and the inclusion now of The Rock in the bloodline, acknowledging Roman Reigns as his tribal chief, that no matter what inning we're in, we're playing a ball game that is going to most likely go into extra innings at some point. Well said. Well said. I mean, you talk about the rise of the rock in the bloodline, Solo Sokoa, his rise in the bloodline, Roman Reigns himself in the bloodline storyline and the saga that's kind of taken on a life of its own in the past four years. Just talking about the storytelling aspect of what we've been getting on television. You talked about it ad nauseum in the last couple of years and what we're seeing, the role that you have in it and the strength of the storyline and, and the storytelling and whatnot. We just saw it literally last night as we speak right now on Raw with what closed the show with Rock and Cody. We saw it with Cody and Roman last week. Do you think that what we've seen from the bloodline in the last couple of years, but specifically in the last, I don't know, I'd say six months to a year since the rise of Triple H and Creative Power has kind of taken on like an extra emphasis on the storyline or storytelling aspect, excuse me, of the bloodline and how the, the role that Roman Reigns has played and kind of the emphasis on the extra storytelling going forward in the last couple of months and so? I think under the creative guidance of Paul Levesque, the audience is more cognizant of our pursuit to define storyline first at all times. But it has been that way for us since August 2020. Mm -hmm. Just the very way that we revealed the fact that Roman Reigns was no longer the big dog and Brock Lesnar's advocate was about to become a special counsel slash wise man. And the big dog was about to become a tribal chief. Just the way we let that play out on television was the infancy of the bloodline storyline. So it's always been storyline first for us. And I think it took until the Paul Levesque era for the audience to realize just how much we incorporate the mantra of storyline first at all times. In the teaser that WWE put out yesterday for this documentary airing this weekend on Easter, no less, and the anniversary of the first WrestleMania, Paul, I got to give you credit for that. You, you mentioned that before we went live here. Um, but in the teaser for the documentary, you mentioned that, or it's mentioned that Hulk Hogan, the Undertaker, John Cena, Shawn Michaels all acknowledge Roman Reigns. And that's a big part of it. But does Roman Reigns acknowledge Paul Heyman? You're going into the Hall of Fame, Paul. First of all, congrats on that. But does Roman Reigns acknowledge the greatness that is beside him in the wise man that is Paul Heyman? Well, I don't know a higher compliment I can be paid than to be called the wise man. And that nickname comes to me from Roman Reigns. I wouldn't dare have given myself the moniker of the one. Advocate, 
I took from the fact that my father, who was a personal injury attorney, would be in court. He'd piss off the judge. Wow, a Heyman pissing off an authority figure. Who would ever thunk it? <laughs> um, uh, my father would push a judge to the limit. The judge would admonish my father. My father would say, oh, oh, oh your honor, I'm just an advocate. And I took that from my father. Special counsel uh, Roman Reigns came up with because I wanted to bestow upon him the name the tribal chief. Mm -hmm. And he said the tribal chief would have a council. Uh, and therefore, as 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 the as the leader of my council, you would be my special counsel. Um, but I would never have called myself the wise man because that name has deep roots in WWE folklore. The term manager, which was used heavily before my time, uh, there were three managers in the Northeast in the old WWWF led by Vincent James McMahon, Vince Sr. Captain Lou Albano, Freddie Blassie, Ernie Roth, who was known as the Grand Wizard. And they had a monopoly on the antagonist side, the villain side, the heel side, and WWWF for, for a generation. They were known collectively as the three wise men of the East. And to call myself the wise man, when growing up under the three wise men of the East, to me would be sacrilege. I couldn't give myself that name. It'd be like anointing yourself king or emperor. Someone has to do it for you. And, and one day out of the blue, uh, Roman Reigns just said, you are my wise man. And, and, and it moved me to tears. Um, because it, it, it's perhaps the greatest honor ever bestowed upon me uh, in, in, this, in, in or out of this industry, with the exception of my children call, calling me dad. Um, so uh, I try to live up to that on a daily basis in the same way that every performance that, that, that I, I am blessed with the opportunity to, to present to me, is just an audition to appear the next time. Uh, every day of my life, I try to live up to that moniker of being Roman Reigns' wise man because you can only be judged by your worst day and your worst performance. And my worst performance still has to be better than anybody else's best. So does the tribal chief acknowledge Paul Heyman? He acknowledged me by naming me the wise man um which now everybody calls me i did now, now it's not like paul how you doing now it's wise man how are you <laughs> um so I, I, everybody is is uh is compelled and constrained to pay respect to me in meeting me by calling me a wise man and that's all because of roman reigns is there anywhere you draw the line as far as who calls you wise men, whether it just be talent or like fans coming up to you calling you wise men? Is there anywhere where you draw the line there? Oh, no. As a matter of fact, I get pissed if someone doesn't call me wise man. <laughs> well, I, I wish I got the memo because I would have started this by calling you wise man. Okay. I mean, I listen, but... by, by calling me wise man, ultimately, you're acknowledging your tribal chief, Roman Reigns. Okay. Well put. Well, speaking of Roman, you talk about, I love the inspiration there with the wise man of wrestling and you talk about the history there. I know you mentioned Recently in another interview, I forgot where it was, talking about the island of relevancy and where that kind of came from. Amazing genesis there. And that's a whole other story in and of itself. But you talk about Roman. Is there anyone from WWE or wrestling's past in general? Roman is the one and only. We know that. But is there anyone from wrestling's history that Roman reminds you of, that, that you see shades of in Roman Reigns? Well, that's why in the biography, we wanted to interview Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, John Cena, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, The Undertaker. Uh, we, we wanted to explain the life of the absolute number one undisputed top star in the industry. What does it take from you? What does it demand of you? What sacrifices do you need to make? We've all heard the stories. No birthday parties, no anniversaries. You miss your kids' ball games. You miss graduations. Uh, you miss funerals and weddings. But what else does it take out of you? 
what is the demand? What is the burden of being the absolute undisputed number one top star in the, not just in WWE, but it's in this entire industry? Um, Hulk Hogan can speak to that. Ric Flair can speak to that. John Cena can speak to that. Steve Austin can speak to that. Triple H can speak to that. Shawn Michaels can speak to that. The Undertaker can speak to that. And we're not doing the biography of Roman Reigns after his run, where he can reflect back, well, you know, during my time as champion, during my time as the biggest box office attraction in the history of sports entertainment, during the time I had lifted the industry from the pandemic to unfathomable heights. We're in the middle of this, of this run. We're in the middle of this tenure at the very top. So what, what is that like for him now as he's living the life, as he's driving the dream, as he's elevating the industry? And what happens to him afterwards as told by those who also lived the life, drove the dream, aspired to heights no one else had ever accomplished before? So to me, that's, that's a, 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 a fascinating look at their perspective of the position and Roman in the position at this very moment. So I don't know if that means he reminds me of them, but he certainly makes me think of them because they all lived the life. They all were number one without question, without a number two, three, four, and five. And that's who he is right now, which is another reason why we were so particular about how we wanted this biography to be presented because it's unlike any other biography that's ever been on A&E. This is not, you know, um, looking, well, we're, we're sitting here with Gene Hackman, who's 90 years old, let's talk about your career. We're sitting here with Clint Eastwood, who's almost 100. Let's talk about your entire career. We're right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 this is the blaze period. This is, the, the, this is Leo DiCaprio now. This, this, is, this is the hottest, you know, this is uh, Killian Murphy now. This is Tom Hardy now. This is not even Tom Brady right after all the Super Bowls. This is now in, mm -hmm. in the crux of it. So, um, you know, this is Brock Purdy. So, you know, it, 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 it's a, you know, th this is Steph Curry with years to go, mm -hmm. with more championships to win. So that's why, to me, it's so fascinating because this is not how biographies are usually done. This is, you know, the, this is the old boxer sitting, you know, the, the biographies are done. The old boxer sits in front of the black and white stutter, stepping, you know, oh, yeah, not that, oh, man, that guy hit me so hard, you know, it rattled my brain. It's not it. This is, this is someone saying, I have more to look forward to than I have tales to tell already. So it's 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 again it's 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 why we we were so particular about this biography is that it's such a unique narrative and had to be told from that perspective. Going off all that, Paul, as we wind down here, last question for you. I think you summed it up perfectly as far as your Hall of Fame induction coming up as well. As far as Roman still being in his peak, literally as we speak right now, doing a biography on him, the Hall of Fame works the same way. A lot of people go in after their career is over. Rey Mysterio, we know, went in last year while he was still active. Flair went in when he was still active 15 years ago. But that's really where the line is drawn, though. You're in elite territory here. Is that why you agreed to go in this year while you're still very much in the heat of things? I know we're in Philly, obviously. That's a factor. But I was surprised that you accepted while you're still very much active and at your peak on WWE TV. I, I was surprised I accepted, too. <laughs> um, um, I have been offered the uh, the WWE Hall of Fame a few times already, and I've turned it down because I, I never wanted to do it while still active. Because if my in my heart, if my perspective is, I'm going to accept this lifetime achievement award and continue on for a little while. That's not much of a, of a goal for the future. The goal for the future right now is to make everyone regret 
asking me to accept this honor this year because the true value of my Hall of Fame career came after 2024. That the heights that I can reach after this induction make what happened before this induction pale by comparison. I accepted the award this year, number one, because it's in Philadelphia. And it's a unique opportunity that we are a few blocks away from the corner of Swanson and Rittner where the ECW arena sat. And to do it is me acknowledging Phil, because you'd think I'd want to take this in New York. Mm -hmm. Do this in Yankee Stadium in the Bronx where I'm originally from. I'm doing this in Philly. It's an homage to Philly. Number one, Philly because it allowed me to do ECW. Number two, I'm doing this because my kids have been nagging me about it for years. When are you going to accept the Hall of Fame? When are you going to accept the Hall of Fame? And I think number one is because they really do want to see their father be honored. And number two, I don't think either one of them want to give a speech after my death. <laughs> so they don't want to take it posthumously. And they're like, let the old man just take take the freaking award already. Yeah. Um, and number three, and, and perhaps this is the, the most profound reason. This is the first year that Triple H, Paul Levesque, has chosen the entire class of the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And one of my life's great honors has been witnessing the work that Paul Levesque has done as the chief creative officer in WWE. The shoes that he has to fill, the accomplishments that he has to live up to, the disruption of the entire industry that he has to follow is a task that no man or woman would ever look at with a reasonable perspective. And he has not only lived up to it, but we are in the midst of the hottest run in the history, not just of WWE, but in all of sports entertainment. We are smashing records every quarter and every year, and now every night. Merchandise records, tele television license fees, uh, attendance figures in gross and in net. The performers are making more on an average than ever before in the history of the industry, even with inflation taken into account. Um, and that's because of the magnificent job that Paul Levesque has done to be the first person named to the Hall of Fame by Paul Levesque, to be the first headliner of a class that he has chosen is one of the greatest honors of both my career and my life. And it would be a terrible disservice to Paul Levesque. It would be a grotesque disre uh, d demonstration of disrespect to Paul Levesque if I were to have turned that down. Um, out of respect and admiration for the job that he's done and for the man himself, I'm honored to be inducted this year. Plus it's in Philly, plus it's WrestleMania 40, and plus for once, it gives me something that shuts my damn kids up. <laughs> well, that's a must see speech. I'm looking forward to being there. I'm looking forward to watching it. I'm looking forward to watching this documentary too. Like I mentioned, Paul, coming up this Sunday on Easter. It's an Easter special, basically. A biography, WWE Legends on A&E, airing on uh, A&E this Sunday, March 31st. So I look forward to it. Paul, this has been great. Always a fascinating chat. The last time we spoke, yeah, recommended Angel with Dirty Wings. I still have yet to watch Angel, it. Angels with Dirty Faces. Oh, what did I say? I always say Wings. It's Angel Dirty Faces, but Angels it's still my watch list. And you haven't watched it, so you haven't completed your assignment. <laughs> that was a year and a half ago. Shame on you, young you. man. What'd you say? Shame on you. I know. I failed you. I failed you, wise man. But by the next time we speak, I promise I will have watched it. Please acknowledge your tribal chief, Roman Reigns. I will. Thanks a lot, Paul. I appreciate the time. Congrats again. Thank you very much, sir.